I always hope and pray and intend for there to be a message in the music that I play, a message that will speak to you. This song, this prelude is about praying and it's for you I am praying. So I thought this prelude might be a good time for you to pray for someone. Please join me for our opening prayer. Father God, it is so good to join with our brothers and sisters to worship you today. We confess that although we often stray from you, it is our heart's deepest desire to abide with you in your most holy place. Help us, Father, to walk blamelessly before you, always doing what is right and living in your truth. Help us to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, that we may dwell with you always. We ask these things in his precious name. Amen. Good morning. My name is Kylie, and we, welcome, we want to welcome you into worship with us. Whether you're here in person or watching online, we are so glad you've chosen to be in worship with us today. Hopefully you saw the announcements scrolling through on our screen or in yours before the service began. If you missed them, they can be found on our Facebook page. That is an excellent source of information about the life of our church, so please visit it often. I have a few brief announcements for you this morning. First, we have our February calendars available on the information table at the back of the sanctuary. Those highlight the events we have going on here at the church. Taking a look ahead at some of those, our First Fruits Children Ministry will be having a Hearts for the Homebound Family event on Saturday, February 4th from 4 to 6 in the Community Center. It's going to be a Valentine's Day activity to show love for our homebound members. We hope you can come and join us. Next, Lent is just a few weeks away and we will enter into that sacred season with an Ash Wednesday service on Wednesday, February 22nd at 6.30. Please mark your calendars, invite your friends, and plan on being with us in worship that evening. 
Finally, the discernment team will be having an all-church informational meeting on Sunday, February 19th, immediately following our morning worship service at 11 o'clock here in the sanctuary. Please mark your calendars for that important meeting. And now, will you please join me for our call, from, our call to worship? It comes from Micah 6. What can we bring to the Lord? Should we bring him burnt offerings? Should we bow before God the Most High, offerings of yearly calf? Should we offer him thousands of rams and ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? No, O oh people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you. To do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So we have an opportunity to offer an appropriate New Testament sacrifice of praise through these songs that we sing. The first is 185 in the hymnal, When Morning Gilds the Skies. So let's stand and sing with all our hearts. skies, high heart awaking cries, may Jesus Christ be praised, alike at work and prayer, to Jesus I repair, may Jesus Christ be praised. The night becomes as day When from the heart we say May Jesus Christ be praised The powers of darkness fear When this sweet chant they hear May Jesus Christ be Let all the earth around ring joyous with the sound. May Jesus Christ be praised in heaven's eternal bliss. The loveliest strain is this. May Jesus Christ be praised. Be this while life is mine, my canticle divine. May Jesus Christ be praised. Be this the eternal song. Christ be praised. Good singing. 395 if you're messing with your hymnal. Otherwise, just look up here. Take time to be holy, speak oft with thy Lord, abide with him always, and feed on his word. Make friends of God's children, help those who are weak. Forgetting in nothing his blessing to seek. Take time.
time to be holy. The world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus, like him thou shalt be. Thy friends in thy conduct his likeness shall see. Take time to be holy, let him be thy guide, and run not before him, whatever be tied. In joy or in sorrow, still follow the Lord. And looking to Jesus, still trust in his word. Take time to be holy, be calm in thy soul. Each thought and each motive be his control. Thus led by his spirit to fountains of love, thou soon shall be fitted for service above. Good singing. Have a seat. Good morning. It's my pleasure to uh, be able to introduce to you our Gideon speaker for this morning, Joe Dowdy. Uh, Joe's been in Bible study with me for uh, over a year now, and um, I, I know uh, from what he shares on Thursday afternoons with us, uh, he has a uh, wonderful knowledge and commitment to sharing God's Word, and so he's going to share with us today on behalf of the Gideons. Um, Following this service, we will have Gideons at both the ramp door exit and the, the door heading into the community center, educational wing, um, taking up an offering for them. So I invite you to look for them. Joe, thank you. Stuart was a Gideon, or is a Gideon, in New Guinea. And he found himself checking into a motel in a town called Wau. And after checking, he ran across one of the ladies that worked there named Lynette. So striking up a conversation, the typical Gideon that he was, he presented her with a, a little personal worker's testament. She seemed very gracious and humble to receive it, so he proceeded a little bit further. He explained to her the help session in the front and began working through the testament, and he stopped at John 3.16. He asked her to read that, and she read it. And then he asked her, do you believe that? She said, yeah, I do. And uh, noting her, her humility, he simply asked her, he says, do you think you have eternal life? Lynette thought for a moment. She wasn't sure. He said, okay. So he had to go back in to uh, John uh, chapter 11, verse 25, and had her read it. And after she finished reading, he explained the very the last three little phrases. Whoever believes in me, though he die, he shall live. He, he knew that this lady believed and he knew this lady had all the potential to be something that God wanted her to do. Like the only thing she hadn't done was confess Jesus as her Lord and Savior. So he told her to go to the back of the Testament. And when he got there, he said, would you like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And Lynette said, yeah. And she prayed the most humblest and sweet sinner's prayer, signed the back of the Testament, became a new citizen of heaven. Brother Bill was a Gideon from Alabama. Now, Brother Bill found himself in New York City, and he went up there for a distribution. And while he was up there, he was assigned duty on Times Square. As a matter of fact, he was on Fifth Avenue. 
He's walking down the street and he saw a couple of fellas sitting on a sidewalk, Tangelo and Andrew. They went up to him, struck up a conversation, handed him personal worker testaments, and uh, went on to explain a little bit about the help session in the front and went to the back and said, there's a place for you to make a commitment to Jesus Christ if you want to. He said he felt prompted by the Spirit, so he looked at the boys. He said, fellas, he said, you think God's going to let you into heaven? And the boys just kind of looked at each other and smiled just a little bit. <laughs> and they said, yeah. Well, Bill said, well, how do you know? Ah, we're good guys. We do good things. And Bill said, okay. He said, you know, God has a test. He said, would you guys like to partake in this test? And the boys were, you know, feeling pretty strong and secure about themselves and said, sure. So Bill just looked at him and said, you fellas ever tell a lie? And the boys kind of looked at each other and smiled just a little bit at each other. You know, that little boyish grin that they have and he agreed that they had. So Bill looked at him and said, what's that make you? The boy said, well, a sinner. Bill said, yeah, but it also makes you a liar. He said, okay, fellas, have you fellas ever stolen anything? And the boys looked at each other again. They had that little boyish grin on their face. They were just smiling back and forth. They said, yeah. And Bill said, what's that make you guys? The boys caught his drift. He said, uh, a thief. Bill said, yeah. Bill paused for a second. He said, fellas. So Jesus tells us that if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, it's the same thing as committing adultery with that woman. Have you fellas ever done that? This time the boys kind of looked at each other, but they weren't smiling so much. They paused for a moment. They didn't quite know what to say. But they did say they had. They were honest in what they said. And Bill looked at him and said, Fellas, I've gave, asked you three questions out of ten. Said, your answers have been short. Do you still think God's going to let you into heaven? The boys looked at each other, and this time they weren't smiling so much. Bill said, do me a favor. Turn to the back of your text. Go to Romans 6.23. And he explained to them that the wages of sin were death. And if we die in our sins and die away from Jesus, we'll spend eternity without him. He said, but God had a plan, and that plan was called Jesus Christ. So he asked him to go over to, to uh, Romans 10, verse 23, and read it. For all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. He said, fellas, do you want to call on the name of the Lord? The fellas stopped for a moment and they said, yeah. Both these guys prayed a sinner's prayer and received Jesus into their hearts. And fellas, folks, I share these testimonies with you for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, Isaiah 55, 11, Pastor, as I told you, you would hear this again. Um, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth that shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the things whereto I send it. Clearly in this case, things have happened. People's lives have been changed simply because God's word was presented to them. Second thing I wanna share with you is this church supports this association and you have over the years. Folks, these are your testimonies. You folks are directly responsible for somebody coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, whether you know it or not, through your prayers, through your offerings, through the service that the Gideons do. You have to understand that we're all the same, all of us Gideons, worldwide. Uh, no matter where you go, the only difference between us is the language that we speak. If we all have Jesus in our heart. We're all Christian and business and or professional men and their wives who have joined the ministry. We're all members in good standing of a local Protestant or evangelical church. We all come with the recommendation of our pastors. And most importantly, we all have a personal relationship with Jesus. We're just another generation, and the men who founded this association, Mr. Hill and Mr. Nicholson, as they were traveling, found themselves sharing a motel room outside of Janesville, Wisconsin in 1898, discovering they were Christians and reading the word, and, and during their prayer time, God gave these men both the same vision, and that vision was to share his word with the traveling people of the day. From that humble beginnings, we're just another generation. There's about 260,000 Gideon and auxiliary around the world. God has blessed us with over 12,000 camps in over 199 different countries, territories, or possessions. He's allowed us to print his word in 108 different languages, and he's allowed us to distribute a little over two and a half billion copies of his word worldwide since 1898. You should know that we're getting back to pre-COVID levels and things that are going on. We have two major scripture distributions coming up in Mexico and Nicaragua in the next couple of months. And also I explained to you last time I talked to you about Ukraine, those activities are still going on. And you should know that even in the state of Kentucky, when we had the tornadoes and the flooding, we were doing the same thing. The local Gideons were out sharing a word of prayer, 
providing testaments for folks uh, who, who, who needed one or who didn't have one. So perhaps by this time you might be asking how you might participate with us. Uh, I would uh, ask you to pray for us. But I ask you not just to pray for the Gideons. I ask you to pray for those folks who receive these testaments around the world. I ask you that they will open, read, and allow the Holy Spirit to reach and touch their lives. If you're a business or a professional person or retired from that, if you're a military person, grade E5 and above, if these testimonies are tugging at your heartstrings and God is saying you need to get involved in something bigger than yourself, I'll be glad to talk to you after the service. Or David Ryle, he's also a Gideon. Uh, you can talk to either one of us after the service. If being a, a member is not something you can do, we have something called uh, the Friends of the Gideons. Pastor, you can be a friend of the Gideons. I have brochures which explain that. We have a life book for the youth. Uh, that All you have to do is go to Gideons.org. They'll send you 500 copies for your charge. And we also have something called a Living Memorial Bible Plan. If you're at a point in your life where you want to do something that stretches beyond your life, uh, I would invite you to go to Gideons.org and just follow the prompts. They'll tell you exactly what to do. How much you support us? We have two Gideon card racks in this church. One's right around the corner. One is at the entrance to the community center. I would encourage you to use the cards to dedicate Bibles uh, in memory, in honor, in recognition, or just thinking of somebody. Uh, the cards are pretty self-explanatory. There's an insert with your bulletin, and that's pretty self-explanatory. The only thing I would say with that insert on the back there is a little square barcode. If you have a smartphone, you can click on that barcode, and it'll take you to a, a very secure website if you choose to make a monetary uh, donation. That way you can do it. The pastor has graciously allowed David and myself to stand at the exits at the end of the service uh, with them there with an open Bible. If you want to make a cash contribution, you can. Let me share with you that every dollar you donate to this association goes to the purchase and the shipment of Bibles. The administrative costs are paid by the membership through dues and bequeaths. Let me also share with you that 35 cents out of every dollar you, uh, you donate stays here in Jespin County and allows us to buy the Bibles and the Testaments that we distribute. And if, if you look, you'll see us at the county fair. You'll see us at Treats on Main, where we try to be sure that we give scriptures to children that are at least in the fifth grade and to their parents. You'll also see us at Asbury in, in the fall on the college side. Uh, we have done distributions on the college side uh, also in March. We have a gentleman who visits the local jail uh, every other month where we hand out testaments and scriptures. We pray for those folks that are incarcerated. And we also do something with the food pantry uh, with the county. In November, uh, around Thanksgiving, they have a food distribution. We're down at the local firehouse down the street uh, handing out scriptures and testaments to everybody that's there. So we are active in the community. Folks, I share with you too, everything that we do, there's still one in four people who want to receive a testament on our large distribution simply won't get them. And they don't get them because their resources aren't there to provide them. And we get all, all of our resources come from our churches. Uh, we simply do not print Bibles without the resources to pay for them. So I ask you to keep that in prayer as we move along. And also, uh, Pastor Tony, you and I have shared before that I pray for you. And I still do. And I will until God says, Joe, don't pray for Tony anymore. And um, the only thing I can tell you is he's not told me not to pray for anybody. And when I try to change my prayer list, uh, he makes it very well known that uh, I need to continue praying for everybody. So for Tony and Becca, I pray God's blessings on y'all and y'all's families. For this church, I pray God's blessings on you and everything that you do and for all the support that you've given us over the past years. God bless you all. Thank you, Joe. Now, would you pray with me as our ushers uh, come forward as we prepare our hearts to take up our morning offering? Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you give us. We thank you for the gift that it is to be here today. And in this moment, as we give back just a portion of that which you've already given us, we pray that you would give us generous hearts and that you would take these offerings and break them and bless them and use them to feed the multitude. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Please stand if you are able and join me as we affirm our faith at the Apostles' Creed. Brothers and sisters, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. In the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for today's scripture reading. <clears throat> Our scripture today comes from Psalm 15. O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Those who walk blamelessly and do what is right and speak the truth from their heart, who do not slander with their tongue and do no evil to their friends, nor take up a reproach against their neighbors, in whose eyes the wicked are despised, but whose, who honor those who fear the Lord, who stand by their oath even to their hurt, who do not lend money at interest, and do not take a bribe against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be moved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Kylie, and thank you, Beth and Terry. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for the way that it speaks into our lives, and shapes and changes us. We thank you for your spirit that so inspired this word and faithfully carried it to us and is here among us today. We pray by the power of your spirit that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts that we might receive you and receive you well. In Jesus' name, amen. What makes something holy? When you think of songs like O Holy Night, or places like Mount Sinai, or things like the tabernacle, that giant tent where the Israelites used to worship and come and offer sacrifices to God, what do those three things have in common? Those are places and examples of God's presence among God's people. Now, many of us go through life looking for magical experiences those times when we get goosebumps, when we feel that electrical tingling in the air, and we're surprised by unexpected beauty and pleasurable experiences. And those experiences are wonderful blessings, and they're usually too short-lived, aren't they? However, that's different from a holy experience. When you read the accounts of people in the Bible who had holy experiences, you realize very quickly that they're not always pleasurable experiences. Being on a boat in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of a fierce storm, is not a pleasurable experience. However, Jonah, the disciples, and John Wesley in the early 1700s all had such an experience. Jonah was terrified and overcome by guilt for running from God. The disciples were overwhelmed and they cried out to Jesus who was just sitting there sleeping in the boat. And John Wesley was also overwhelmed and thought he would die when he witnessed a group of foreign Christians singing peaceful hymns during the storm. Those were all holy moments that changed lives forever. The many biblical dictionaries will describe the concept of holiness in, in two kinds of ways. The first is that holiness is a quality of being separated out for particular use. For example, my mom had a pair of scissors that were just used for sewing. We got in big trouble when we took those scissors and made snowflakes out of paper with them. 
Those scissors were separated out for particular work and they were not to be used just for any common task. So to be holy means to be set aside for God's use, not just for anything. And God calls each one of us to be holy, not just the pastors. He has particular work for each of us to do. Now, the second idea of holiness is connected to a concept of glory and a sort of weighty presence of God when we experience him. Sometimes the air feels thicker around us. And the ancient worshipers, they would fill their worship spaces with incense and smoke to help illustrate that idea. And chances are you've experienced that kind of atmospheric heaviness. And it may not have even been in a church service. We often sense God's presence the most when he's calling us to get up and do something, whether that's to get up and share Jesus with someone, to check and see how someone is doing, or sometimes even to hold on for dear life because if God doesn't save you, nothing will. Now we know that the way that we pray affects our lives, but today we're gonna look at how the way we live shapes our prayers. Now, today's psalm that Kylie read for us is short and to the point. Do the right thing. If you want to be in God's house, in God's presence, and be God's people, do as he tells you to do. If only it were that easy, right? Now, here is David laying it down plain and clear, all the do's and don'ts for those who want to follow Jesus. Do walk blamelessly and do what is right. Do speak the truth from your heart. Don't slander with your tongue. Don't do evil to your friends or neighbors. Do despise the wicked and do honor those who fear the Lord. Don't lend money at interest or take a bribe against the innocent. Now, reading this psalm makes me feel like that rich young ruler who met Jesus and told them, yeah, I've been pretty good my whole life. No major sins come to mind. And Jesus, let's just agree to forget middle school altogether, right? I haven't murdered anyone, at least not that I'm aware of, but I've not walked blamelessly. I've not always done what is right. Sometimes I keep the truth to myself and lie by omission. I've spoken ill of many people, probably this week. Some of them I've never even met outside seeing a short clip on the news. I've neglected friends and neighbors when they needed help. Most days I just try to ignore the wicked, and I rarely go out of my way to help anyone or honor anyone. The only thing I can cling to is that I can't remember giving a loan to anyone ever, but I wouldn't trust my memory on that, and I've probably been given a bribe and didn't even know it at the time. It's one thing to say to do the right thing, and another thing altogether to do it. So what happens when the words of our prayers and our actions don't match? Well, we have a choice. We can choose to change our actions to match our prayers. For example, if I pray to God for help reading my Bible every day, but I use my free time to binge watch a new television show, it's not going to work out very well. So I can choose to change my actions and use the time I usually spend to watch TV reading my Bible, using my actions to receive the answer to my prayer. Or we can choose to change our prayers. For example, I could pray for opportunities to serve God, but if I refuse to take any chances that come my way, I'll find myself stuck again. So instead of changing my actions, I can just quit praying for ways to serve and be done with it. So it's true that if we don't back up our prayers with our actions, we may not receive the answers that God gives us for those prayers. And even worse, if we continue to do that over time, we may quit praying those prayers altogether. Now think about that for a moment. Every time we pray, whether it's for the forgiveness of our sins or to forgive others, if it's prayers for healing, or even prayers thanking God for the blessings that he's given us, there are actions that we will take that will either support those prayers or they will contradict them. Now, we all struggle to do the right thing every day, 
and we all discover moments when our words and our actions do not line up. But if we stay in that place of contradiction, instead, we either choose to change our actions to match our prayers of faith and to grow closer to God, or we can choose to change our prayers to match that, to match our unfaithful actions and grow away from God. So how we receive God's answers in prayer with our actions, or our prayers without words, perhaps. How we receive those answers with our actions influence the very prayers that we pray with words. And that then affects our faith. So when we pray for faith, God gives us what we need to grow. And then we can respond to either receive or reject those blessings every day. We either walk toward or we walk away from God, one step, one choice, and one prayer at a time. Now, sometimes when we feel stuck and are not growing, it's because our actions are contradicting the words we're praying, and it's like trying to hit the accelerator and the brake in your car at the same time. Those prayers don't move us. Instead, they leave us stuck and frustrated, and eventually we give up. We put it in neutral, and we let the world come and pull us whatever direction it wants to, and usually away from God. So what can we do about this? How can we get through our contradictions and grow closer to God? Well, first, we have to admit that we don't have all the answers. We don't know the right thing to do in every circumstance. Now, we can grow in that knowledge. We can learn from Scripture. We can talk with other Christian teachers and mentors, join a Sunday school class or small group with people around us, and we can look for else, uh, answers elsewhere but we'll never know enough for every single situation that crosses our path. So we need to pray to God for the Holy Spirit to give us the guidance that we need. And second, when we pray for that guidance, we need to back it up with our actions. We need to follow God's guidance when we receive it. And if we start with the small things, they will build our faith up. So we will begin to trust God more with the bigger things that come our way. Now, you've probably heard the phrase, Jesus, take the wheel, right? It's a prayer that we often pray when we find ourselves in trouble and need God's help getting out. The problem with that prayer is that God doesn't come in and take us over. Instead, he gives us the guidance and the choice to follow his instructions. So he's not going to just reach over and grab the wheel, but he's always happy to give us directions on where to turn. But for that guidance to work, we must follow more than just turning directions. We also need to follow his directions for the gas and the brake pedal. When he tells us to go, we need to go. And when he tells us to stop, we need to stop. We need to follow his directions regarding how fast to go. All of it matters, and we can't figure it out on our own, but we don't have to. We can ask God for help with everything, and then trust and follow Jesus with both our words and our actions. We need to stop asking Jesus to take control of us and start taking his guidance on what we do with both our hands and our feet. And David ends this prayer by claiming that those who have faithful deeds will not be moved. And we want intentionally to move closer to Jesus. But we don't want to be pushed or pulled away from him. God calls us to be a church that is faithful in our prayers for others as well as ourselves. And each of our prayers that we pray will have words that connect us with God. And they will have hands and feet that will keep us firmly on the path following Jesus. Would you pray with me today? Lord, we've been learning about prayer all this month and, the, and the, the blessing that it is that you allow us to come and gather and talk with you. We thank you that you know us better than we know ourselves. You know our, our hurts and our hang-ups, our weaknesses, our flaws, our dents and our scars. You know all of that. And you know even more than us. And we thank you that uh, you send your spirit to pour into us because you see that potential of who we could be, who you're calling us to be. 
if we will put down our own wills to ask you for guidance and follow where you lead. Lord, you, you make things so simple for us. Simple but not easy. And you offer us your strength when we don't know or don't feel that we have the power to go through on our own. But Lord, we are your church. And we are only here today because of what you've done for us. So we thank you for that. And we come to you today. And we pray the prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our final song is designed to keep us praying, so stay seated. we have been in prayer with our great and holy God. And he's raising up that holiness in you through your prayers and giving you opportunities with every step that you take. We have Sunday school starting in just a moment. We'll be back this evening for a hymn singing at 6 p.m. There are opportunities for you to continue to grow your faith. And I just pray that you would not neglect those that come across your path and just sharing a little bit of what God has given you today. Lift us up in Jesus' name. Amen.